we do. Mr. Van says we have a sound problem, so if you can hear me, I'm going to switch back to our starting soon while we try to figure that out. Oh, no, I don't know whether I can. Okay, oops. Um, let me... Sorry, guys, if you're in here trying to figure out the sound. Okay, so what's the problem with it? I can't hear it from here. Can you just tell me? Sorry, guys. Okay, um, don't know the answer. What was the solution? Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm going to re-plug this in and see what happens. We'll do a test here. So can you see that? Oh, yeah, they can see the actual thing. Okay, well, there we go. Can you still hear the buzz? Okay. Oh, yeah, you guys are a little bit behind. There's a little delay. Sorry. The irony of it is that we spent all this time trying to figure out all the technical stuff before we started tonight. So, blah. Um, can you still hear it? Buzz is still there. Yeah. Buzz is still there. Okay. Any suggestions, Mr. Van Star? Um, how about if I try turning down the mic first? Because his suggestion is that I delete the mic. Your, your voice is not too. Your voice is a good amount. Okay. So. Um, I just made one change. So I want to see yep. if the change I made works which is that the mic for the webcam was turned up and I turned that off. So I'm hoping that maybe that might make a difference. We'll see. All right, well, we're gonna get started and he'll let me know and we'll see. Sorry about the buzz, Tessa. All of you, sorry about the buzz. Still there, okay. So if I, um, we're gonna try this. I already unplugged and replugged it. Yeah, I know, I mean, delete the source. And Oh yeah, delete the source. Okay, I'm gonna try deleting the source and re-adding it. Sorry about that. Okay, if we have to live with the buzz, we will, but I hope. So let me try, let me try it, getting rid of the mic and reinstalling it. So just one second. Okay. The buzz just went away. Yeah, I think you just dis the That's because I disconnected the mic. So, you know, the good news is that we know it's a, um, we know that it's a, um, it that it is the mic. Yeah. So, um, but. Okay, you're back and the buzz is not there. Okay. You know what it's doing? It's pulling the sound. I don't know. I don't know. If I'm back oh, and. you just got it back. Yeah, so, um... Okay, there's background noise. <sighs> Sorry about this, guys. The, the irony, here's the irony. Turn the volume down. Look. Before we started tonight, we were talking about how, um, how we always figure this out. <laughs> like, the, we have the sound, but, yeah, we handle it when there's tech issues in the middle, and, yeah, no. Okay, so, all right, I don't want to... How, how bad is it? Like, is it... Okay. Well, the problem is that we have the delay, so he can't tell me for a little bit. Okay. Well, I'm going to start until he gives me an update. You guys, welcome. Look at everyone. Okay, <laughs> Simon, it's better now. Kind of. It's sufficient. It's like there's still some sort of I don't, slow grade. Um, I don't think static. it's... It's only static noise now. The buzz is gone. It's only static noise. And so I think it's probably I don't know why it's doing acceptable. That. So maybe turn it down just a tad more. And then, okay. Yeah, like that. Perfect. Okay, we'll see if this is okay. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. I'll tell you in fifteen seconds. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, um, I want to say that I love this story, and I am tonight going to try to persuade you to love it as well. Although I was so excited to see the chat before we were starting, that so many of you do already like it. Okay, so here's my first question. Um, first question. Do you prefer stories that have a happily ever after or stories that give you all the feels, like the stories that stick with you? And I think like, think back to some of the stories that we did in the spring. And 
I think that some of them were nice, and if I mention them and remind you of them, we think of them. Then there are others that we read in the spring that are just like a knife in the heart, right? And they really stick with you. So what do you like? Oh, Tessa, I'm gonna convert you by the end of the night. I promise. All right, so I want to know, um, I wanna know, do you like it happily ever after or the feels? Tessa refuses to take a stand. She says both, both. I wanna be sad in the middle, but happy with the end. Okay, um, and someone doesn't care. All right, well, while I see the answers come in there, right? I just like good books, right? All right, scale of one to five, scale of one to five, looking to see your decimals here. How much did you like this story? Remember, a five means, oh, Mrs. Van, I really wanna do this one again next month. Um, or at least, I really like this. And a one is, I only came tonight because I really like you. Otherwise, I would be like lighting a voodoo doll on fire that looked like you because I hated this story so bad. So Nancy likes the feels. Um, and then Mark C likes the feels. Yeah, 50 pages, yeah. <laughs> because otherwise it feels unnatural. 50 pages ago, it was all gloom and despair, and then it turns into happy unicorns. I like this. Um, yeah, um, Michael, I agree with you and your mom that stories with a more emotional feel are, are more satisfying. Yeah, I like that. Happy endings are boring. Oh, that's kind of interesting, Will, because do you remember, who was it who said that? I think it might have been Mark who said that um, villains have the best backstories. Ooh, Michael gave it a six. Nice. Mark with a 3.78. Wow, a number of you with good ones. Simon, a 1.1. Ouch. All right, let me see if I can change your mind a little bit. So I knew that there would be resistance to this story. And so I used the Twitter sphere and I asked some friends who are teachers on Twitter to see like what they felt about the story. And this person said that she loves the novel and that the short story doesn't do it justice. So if you don't like the short story, then maybe the novel would be better. Although maybe if you don't like the short story, you have no interest in reading the novel. I asked them if they could give it an elevator speech. Like if you were trapped in an elevator in between floors for just a few seconds and had to give a spiel about the story, what would you say? And this teacher said she couldn't give an elevator speech because of she would be ugly crying. So she likes the story so much. Wow, Anna, the worst st score she's given a story. Okay, Strudel Kitty wouldn't read the novel you paid. You guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna persuade you. So the first thing I wanna say about the story is, this one has stuck with me for nearly 40 years. I first read the story almost 40 years ago and I can still remember like where I was sitting while I was reading this story and how, what an impact it made on me. And I think some stories stick with us and the same stories don't necessarily stick with the same people, but this story is a powerful story. Um, Alfred Lord Tennyson said this, I hold it true whate'er befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I think this is, that phrase, tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, is this very well-known phrase. Probably many of you have um, heard that phrase. I think that this story explores an aspect of that, right? Is it better to have had something and lost it than to never have had it at all? Okay, um, Jason, I did not see that you asked four times, but I will share right now that I received an actual letter in the mail from Tessa and it made my day and I will keep it forever. And it made me cry a little bit, but not ugly cry, just regular cry, but I absolutely loved it. I will treasure it forever. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so then, then here's someone else's version of the quote. Whoever said it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved was full of crap. So we're gonna explore that tonight, right? So let's see. 
All right, so first, before we dive in to why Mrs. Van wanted to inflict this story on you that Strudel Kitty says she just wants to get through this class so that she never has to think about the story again, before we get back to it and why I did that, then I want to share some of the highlights. First of all, I loved this. Um, <laughs> Michael last week, last month, uh, disregard my previous agony. <laughs> I just thought it was hysterical. I thought it could be a, um, a t-shirt. <laughs> disregard my previous agony. I thought it was great. Um, I loved that Christine was like, wait a minute, I saw a different inciting incident and several of you did this, right? Several of you found other possible inciting incidents besides the one that, um, that I had found. And I love that. So when you say, am I really off? What I want to say is when you're asking questions of the story, you're never off. And then, um, I love this, a Mrs. Vanism, because last time I coined that new hashtag, Mrs. Vanism. Um, okay. So, and I'm seeing some reference to the letters. You guys, I have a folder in our filing cabinet over here that's called thanks or something. And it's all the letters I've ever received from students, all the notes I've ever received in all my years of teaching. I have kept every single one and I treasure them. All right. So this is called consensus. I was trying to decide what should we use as our class mascot. And I had suggested my class mascot that I use in my real life class. And that's a naked mole rat, but y'all did not like the naked mole rat. Instead you wanted this one, right? And if you remember, this was the puppet that we named in that, um, who won this Cloudfall? I think won this, right? I think that's right. Well, we named it Serignus, and so I had to go buy another one. And uh, now this is our class mascot. So Serignus will be here every, every time. So we'll, we'll have Serignus as our mascot. So Serignus will help us out. Next, what do we have here? Um, I love this. Overhearing things rarely ends well. You could hear something life-changing that you were never supposed to hear. But in this case, it worked out pretty well. We were talking about, does it pay to eavesdrop, right? Um, and then I loved this exchange of ideas in the live chat. And I love seeing that. Sometimes y'all, the live chat makes me want to stick a hot poker in my eye because you guys get off on weird tangents. But when you guys are discussing and sharing ideas in the live chat, it gives me all the feels. I just love this. And I loved this exchange. I love this idea when we were confronting why his parent, why it said in the story, his parents were too busy to show him love. And I really liked how you guys all pulled out different aspects of it. So super cool. And then, um, <laughs> here's Strudel Kitty backing me up on when the chat gets out of control. So Strudel Kitty, you get an A, right? Um, Okay, and then Kira Shepard said, ooh, I love a positives, which of course is the key to my heart. So I was very grateful for that. And then I loved your <laughs> positive. And then the night, Friday night before Christmas, that year she met her online friends, she finally felt complete. And I hope Cookie Cookie's here tonight. We need our keeper of the hashtags. And so I loved your examples of that. Um, and then more of them, they were so fun. They were so fun. Cloudfall, was it you who won the puppet? No. Was it Cloudfall? Cookie Cookie? Oh, it was one of the two of them. Was it Cloudfall? I'm looking over at Mrs. Van, Mr. Van Star like he knows. I don't know. Um, was it Mr. Was it Cloudfall who won the puppet? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I thought that was it. Um, okay. So, and then I loved this. The thought struck him like an old lady's purse swung at him. The thought struck him like a shard of glass from the shattered mirror of the past. It was so evocative. Just really loved it. Oh, good. She's here. Yay, she's here. Um, and then, okay, you guys had like like Mrs. Miss Van Spawn, which is Jonathan, our son. He moved into his new house. This is a picture of him and our dog Brody um, in what will be the dining room when he ever gets furniture. So um, that's Jonathan and he loved being here, but he's not at home anymore. Um, so I did love this, that Michael was saying like, oh, we're like the <laughs> pawns on a chessboard. That was kind of cute, but in a good way, right? I just thought that was so hysterical. 
Um, I loved this insight that Cloudfall had. There were two of them here. One that we only appreciate joy when it comes with a side of sadness. Oh, I just, I loved that. That could be a whole theme. Like if you're ever writing a story for English class and it fits that story, this would be a beautiful thesis statement. <laughs> it's really beautiful. So super nice. Um, oh, I'm glad you like the rug in Jonathan's house club vault because we gave that to him for Christmas, his birthday, something. We gave it to him for this house. Um, and I just love this. Um, I love this recognition that Rob does a ch have a change of heart. So in the story, the real change is like shown in the dad kind of, but I loved this too. I just love this. Um, and then Deb Coney said his sister made him fake Cheez-Its and I asked him to send me a picture and he did send me a picture. Well, it's Michael sent me a picture and I just thought it was so cool that she made him this. And I thought that was so, so great. Like I, I just thought that's so neat. It made me really want to meet Michael's sister actually, that someone would recognize that he likes Cheez-Its and would then take a lot of time to make him a fake Cheez-It. And I feel like that will be a lucky, um, like a lucky talisman for him forever. All right, so I want you to know, I sent out um, the the um, bookmarks. I hope you got your bookmarks. If you requested one, I mailed them all out from everybody that requested them. And what was super cool was that I got some requests because um, I got some requests via email and they said, um, you know, we always watch the, we always watch a class, but we never say anything. And I just want to say, if you're someone who always comes or comes a lot or doesn't participate live, but watches later and you're, so you're not, we don't, we don't really know about you. Um, you know what? Here's to the people in the back, right? I just want to say, I appreciate you and thank you. All right. Ready to dive in. Here we go. So we've got, oops the plot visit. Okay. So, oh, you got yours, kiddo 39. Yay. That's awesome. Um, you don't even know what those are. If you're talking about, oh, if you don't know what the bookmarks are, I, um, made these, um, bookmarks. If you email me your address, I'm looking over here to see if I have one. Um, I don't think I have any more right over here. Um, if you email me your address, I will mail you an actual Vanstar bookmark in the real mail, like a real bookmark for a real book. All right. Um, so the plot, and if you didn't finish this short story, um, that's okay. Cause you know, that's why we do this is because I still want you to feel like you can participate and that you know what's going on. So, oh, I'm glad you guys like the bookmarks. I love seeing those comments. Oh, yay. I was really happy about them. Okay. So Charlie is an adult with a low IQ who goes to a class with a good teacher. That's the backstory. The inciting incident, I think, is when he was selected for the study. Cookie, cookie, that's about to make me cry. Um, that he was selected for the study. That's the inciting incident. This story has a more clear inciting incident than some that we have looked at. And then the rising action is he gets smarter because they do this operation on him and his IQ triples and, it, and he slowly is getting smarter and then um, he, he actually completes his own study and he falls in love. And then I think this is the climax. Now, I feel like we could have a discussion about this. I think the climax of this story is the only part that maybe some of you might have a different opinion. I'm interested to hear it. Um, I think it's when he yells at everybody in the restaurant who's teasing that other guy and um, who's mentally slow. And I think the reason I say that's a climax is not only that it's such an intense moment because he's like yelling at a bunch of people in a public place, but also because he says only a short time ago I was, now I can see. And so I feel like there's as clear as a bell that this is the moment that the character changes inside, right? Like his mind has been changing, but still. Um, yes, I think you could say that the surgery was the inciting incident. However, I think it's the study selection that really sets the story in motion, right? The surgery is part of the study, but yeah. Um, okay, and then 
deteriorates, um, that's the falling action. He like he's at peak intel, and then he slowly starts to decline. Actually, it's not that slowly. Um, and then the resolution, the end of the story. He leaves. He leaves New York. All right. So that's what I think. Um, Mark says he thinks the climax is when Algernon dies. Yeah, I think you could make that argument. I'm basing the climax on the intensity of the moment, that it's fraught with public emotion, but also the, um, the change in the character. But I'm totally on board with your idea as well. Um, he begins to wish and beg not to lose his intelligence. Oh, Strudel Kitty, I have that quote in here. All right, so I'm looking at your thoughts on this. Um, oh, Cookie Cookie, you need to finish this. All right. For Michael, who objected to a change of theme last time, we are going to read this story not through the lens of justice exactly, but through injustice. So we're going to look at will be injustice. All right. Our first clue that there is something interesting is that it's spelled like this. Progress report, one March. And it's very unusual for an author to use the actual syntax and spelling and grammar of the story to manifest a character. And so this is an unusual thing. It can happen in epistolary novels, which are novels that are told through letters. Um, and then this, in a sense, this is an epistolary novel because we've got the, the um, like diary entries essentially. But I think the, the spelling change is interesting and we know right away this is not the average bear, right? And he says, I want to be smart. And my first question for you is, is it always possible to know that you're not something? Like he realizes he's not smart. And I think if you're like really skinny, you recognize that you're not plump. If you're, you know, brown haired like me, well, like I was, then you know that you're not blonde or you know that you're not, you don't have black hair or red hair. But I'm wondering, are there some things that, um, are there some things that you think are not really possible to realize that you're not? Like, and, and maybe these aren't physical things. Is it possible? Is it always possible to know that you're not kind or that you're not um, patient? or that you're not, um, or that you like talk too much or something like that. Like, is it, is it always possible to know that you're not something? I want, I really want to hear what you have to say about that. Now, um, you guys, you should see, so I can see the chat over to the side and I'm like constantly glancing over there cause I love to hear what you say. And then I'm trying to run two verbal tracks, which you really can't do very well. All right. The Rorschach test. So this is the thing he calls it a raw shark raw shark or something like that in there. And so um, the Rorschach test was created, let me see, yeah, by Herman Rorschach in 1921. And this is a picture of him in 1921. And the idea of the Rorschach test is that they show you a series, it's a set of pictures. They are the same pictures they show everyone. And you're supposed to say what you see in them. And so, um, he, okay, so Simon, I'm gonna push back against you because it, it, his IQ, it says, is only 68. And that is very, very low. We're gonna talk more about that. He does not have, before the operation, he simply does not have the capability to learn. Like he couldn't process and retain. So it isn't that way. So this is interesting. I, I cannot wait to go back and read the chat about this. Can you really know that you're not something? Ooh. Um, okay, so Herman Rorschach, this is kind of a sad story because this picture was taken in 1921 when he invented the Rorschach test, test and he died the very next year. They think of appendicitis. And so what's really sad is that if, it, if he lived today, he'd probably be alive and it's kind of interesting. Um, so the Rorschach test they use to tell like, do you think like other people and what do you see? And normally people will see like, oh, there's two people fighting over something or, oh, there's a butterfly or something like that. And they judge it based on that. So this is what he says. He, Charlie says, all my life, I wanted to be smart and not dumb. And he doesn't care if the operation is, the effects of the operation are only temporary and he doesn't care if it hurts. And 
I there this just stuck with me so much even when I read this when I was like 12 years old is that idea of having something about yourself that you wanted to change so much that you didn't care if it only changed for a little bit of time and you didn't care if you hurt yourself and I think about all the things that people um, that people hate about themselves right and and we would we were willing to do actual damage to ourselves to not be that way and I just felt like this just made me so sad it um actually to be honest at the time that I read this and I I hope okay like eating disorder trigger warning here but um I went through a period of time when I was a teenager that I struggled with anorexia and um, my school counselor, actually, my school counselor and my anatomy and physiology teacher in high school really saved me because my anatomy and physiology teacher is the one who caught it and my counselor is the one who got me help. But I, this resonated me, with me so much because I didn't care if it hurt. And so I think this was, this was part of why the story is so powerful, I think, is that we all kind of feel this way about things, right? Like, oh, I would do anything. Have you heard people say that? Like, oh, I'd do anything to be blank. I'd do anything to have all this money. I'd do anything. And we have lots of stories of people who are willing to do anything, even if it's temporary and even if it hurts. So another test that they give him is the thematic apperception test. And that is noted in the story as well. The thematic apperception test they show you a picture. This is one of the pictures from the test and they ask you what just happened. And so they're trying to get you to tell the story, right? Um, so trying to get you to tell the story and he doesn't do well on this either. He can't do this. All right. So through our lens of fairness, judging people with tests that are super subjective because there's no right or wrong, fair or unfair, fair or unfair. Yeah, Simon, I think you're right. This feeling that he has a drive to become smart and he'll do anything. Um, so Ethan, that's what we started with today, right? Is it that whole quote from Tennyson? Is it better to have loved and lost them or never loved at all? And we're, we're looking at that tonight. So good call there. All right. And then we meet Algernon. Yes, I have an Algernon puppet. We meet Algernon, and Algernon is a white mouse who is a lab rat, essentially, and he has to do this maze in order to get his cheese. You see that my mouse actually has cheese. And so um, this is when another part that I think you could consider an inciting incident because it sets so much in motion. And so he has to race this mouse through the maze. And he overhears this. So it's kind of interesting that Christmas Day in the morning is such a totally different story than this. And yet they've got this similar idea going on here. Most people of his low and, and you know, he puts in these asterisks because he doesn't catch them. Right. He doesn't catch all of the word. He doesn't know what they said. And so he says most people he's overhearing the doctors talk about him. Most people of his low mentality are hostile and uncooperative. They are usually dull, apathetic, and hard to reach. He has a good nature. He's interested and eager to please. Oh, man. And I think, what do you think? Fair or unfair? Making statements like that about such a large group of people. Fair or unfair? Like, is it, is it really a good idea to say everybody who, fill in the blank, is fill in the blank? Like, is that ever good? Like, does it ever work, right? All right, we need to do a little literary class moment on characterization. I don't know if you guys remember seeing this. We've looked at characterization before. In, we have two kinds of characterization that authors use. They use indirect characterization, where we hear the character's thoughts and we hear their words and their actions. And then we have um, the way other people talk about the character and interact with the character. And then we have direct characterization where the narrator says, like, the character was a jerk or the character was wonderful or the character was blank, right? And so in this situation, what we're getting is some indirect characterization in the way that other characters are talking about him. We know that he's patient. We know that he has a good nature. We know that he's motivated, that he's eager to please, right? 
I think you could make a really interesting argument that motivation, while almost always positive, in this story is detrimental to him. That his motivation to be smart ends up actually destroying his life in a lot of ways. So we have different kinds of characters. We have dynamic characters and static characters. So dynamic characters change and static characters stay the same from the beginning of the story to the end. And then um, round and flat characters, round characters are fully developed. We know lots about them. A lot of times we get into their mind. In this case, Charlie is definitely a dynamic round character, only dynamic in an interesting way that we'll discuss later. Flat characters are, um, we don't, we don't know enough about them. They're just like, they're like furniture, right? And um, in this story, flat characters would be people um, like who, who are only mentioned in passing. You know, like you might get like a receptionist mentioned or something like that. That's a flat character. Now, um, I'm going to mention something interesting later about that, but I'll come back to that. Charlie is very unusual because he changes, but then he goes back. And so does that make him static or dynamic? Normally when we say that a character is dynamic, we say from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, this character made a change. But in this story, what we have is beginning of the story to the middle of the story, the character changes. And by the end of the story, the character is in a very important way, his intelligence the same, but is he different? Is he, is he really different? And so I think this is a very interesting character arc in here. And I'm curious, is he really the same? Like his intelligence goes back to what it was, but is Charlie in himself the same? So curious about that. All right, so in the story they say that in the study, this operation is gonna triple his intelligence. So I would like you to meet my friend Alfred. This is Alfred Binet. And he is the one who invented the concept of what we call IQ. So um, let me explain, well, you know what, let me leave it on this slide and I'll explain a little bit about it. Back in like the turn of the century into the 20th century, so the very, very early 1900s, Alfred Binet, who is a French doctor, um, French psychologist, he was asked by the French government how, if he could devise a test that would figure out whether or not people who were mentally retarded could be educated. And so he worked with another doctor whose last name was Simon, who was a um, like phys physician, and they developed a test that, um, that was used to do that. And the reason it was called IQ is that it was an intelligence quotient. So what they did, um, and now we use percentiles, but when IQ first started, they would take your, you know what, I feel like this is like such deep science, I better put on glasses so I look smart. So what they would do is they would um, take, give you a test and see how were you functioning? Like what level were you functioning at? You are 10 years old. Are you functioning like you're 10? Or are you functioning like you're eight? Or are you functioning like you're 12? And then they would take your mental age and they would divide it by your chronological age and multiply it by 100. And that would give you your IQ, your intelligence quotient. And so like if you were 10, and but you were acting like you were eight, then you would have an IQ of 80. If you were 10 and you were acting like you were 12, you would have an IQ of 120. Now, this is the, um, th that's easy, the easy math, right? And when I say acting like, I mean thinking like, right? Okay, so now, still science, still must wear my glasses. Um, thank you, Natasha, for saying that I always look smart. That's a very nice, okay. Um, so we plot IQ on a standard deviation. So most people, 68% of people are in that dark blue in the middle. And almost everything about humans can be plotted this way, height. Like somebody in here in this class is the shortest kid in the class and somebody's the tallest kid in the class, right? Most people are in the middle. Somebody weighs the least, somebody weighs the most, most people weigh in the middle, right? And so somebody has a really big foot, somebody has a super small shoe size, most of us are in the middle, right? Okay. So, um, most people with IQ have IQ here in the middle and, um, Michael's saying IQ tests aren't accurate for people under a certain age. Actually. Yeah. I've, I've written a bunch about this on my website, but the golden age for IQ tests is somewhere between the ages of maybe five or six 
maybe even as old as eight, but I think you can get a good one at five or six and 12. After that and before that, it's a little trickier. Anyway, so um, the problem is that he is way down here and way down here in this lighter blue. And when you're way down there, you're going to struggle. You're really going to struggle. All right. Charlie says, whoa, I have glare now. Charlie says, I'm going to try to be smart. I'm going to try awful hard. Can you try not to be smart? Oh, hi, Erin. Welcome to class. Isn't it awesome how in Mrs. Van's class, there's no tardies. There's no absences. Um, yeah. So can you actually try to be smart? How or how not? Like, are there ways you could try to be smart? And is there a limit to how smart you can get? So I'm kind of interested. Okay, Charlie has all these good luck charms. He has a rabbit's foot. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with these because I don't really think they're a thing, except that when I went and looked, I found this on Amazon. So these are real rabbit's foot, real rabbit's feet. And I don't even want to know how they get them. And I don't understand why they dye them crazy colors, but they do and people carry them around on their keychain for good luck and so he has a rabbit's foot he has another good luck charm too and he says if it works permanent they will make everybody smarter all over the world and my question then is and then what because if everybody's smarter we're still going to plot everybody on the bell curve and even if everybody's like three standard deviations to the right you're still gonna have like you you're still gonna have some people smarter and some people not smarter. I think it will just change the dynamic of what it means to be smart. Like we'll still have this. I think we're, I think it's like, this is my opinion. I'm curious about what you guys think. I feel like it's human nature and almost irresistible to compare. And so I'm curious about what you think about that. All right. Progress report. Ooh, a change, right? Now he's spelling it correctly. We know something's coming. This, you guys, isn't this like the craziest part? These friends of his, okay, the, they're his coworkers, right? They're really my friends and they like me. Sometimes somebody will say, hey, look at Joe or Frank or George. He really pulled a Charlie Gordon. They're really my friends and they like me. Ah, oh, I just, isn't this so painful? Like, you know, you wanna say to him, no, Charlie, they're not your friends. Run for your life, right? No, they're not your friends. And I'm curious, what do you think? Is it more or less cruel that they do that because he doesn't really understand that they're being mean? Like it would be less cruel if he understood that they were being mean to him or is it less cruel because he doesn't understand? I think that's kind of interesting. He says my brains are learning when I sleep. Okay, so I wanted to address this. This doesn't actually work that well. There have been studies done on this to see if you can learn during sleep and some of the studies show like low level stuff. Like if you hear music when you're asleep, that when you're awake, you might recognize it as familiar, but you don't learn in the sense that they have it in this story. You're not gonna learn language, right? You're not gonna learn languages like this. You're not gonna learn the way it does in the story. And some of the studies show that it actually disrupts sleep because the brain needs to have no input, right? The brain needs a break from that so it can do all of the other processes if while it's sleeping, it has lots to do. Okay, so then there's the party scene and one of his so-called friends, right? Um, oh, I see that Michael just put it in friends in quotes and so did I. Um, Charlie is a good card when he's potted and potted is slang for drunk. And then Charlie says, I don't remember how the part how the party was over, but I think I went out to buy a newspaper and coffee for Joe and Frank and then, and when I came back, there was no one there. And I just feel like, that was so mean. He doesn't even realize. They made him go spend money. He's a custodian. Like, he doesn't make that much money. And they have him um, do that. Who just said that? For him, it's better. Anna. Yeah, more cruel, but it's more cruel for us. For him, it's better. Oh, nice, Anna. Um, so every time I see Anna's name, I feel like I'm channeling my Canadian great-grandma. Like, I like because my great-grandma was Canadian. And I just feel like every time I see Anna's name, it just reminds me of my great grandma. So um, she died when I was 10, but I still remember her a lot. So, um, and I still, I'm still related to lots of people who live in Canada. So um, I think this is just so mean and, and it's just so vicious and he doesn't even realize it, it's so painful. Do you think they realize how cruel they are? 
do you think do you think that they accept how cruel they are or do you think they think that just because he's stupid it's like just because they think he's stupid they they don't think it's cruel in the same way like i don't know my son and i were talking about something the other day related to fish and he was like i don't really care what the fish think and i thought ooh, i wonder if it's because we don't think of the fish as being that sentient which means thinking right okay so a month in he beats algernon and he says i must be getting smart to beat a mouse like that, but I don't feel smarter. And I think this is just true of so many things that you can be getting incrementally better and you don't really recognize it. Oh, kiddo39 and Ben are also Canadian. That is so cool. All right, um, I think this is just true of so many things that, that you don't realize what's happening. You don't realize the small changes. So Aljean goes in to eat, so he has to learn something new to get his food. And that made me sad because if he couldn't, because if he couldn't learn, he would be hungry. And I, I think that this shows the connection that Charlie recognizes himself in Algernon. That I know that Algernon is a mouse and Charlie is a human, but in a lot of ways, Charlie is a guinea pig, right? He's a guinea pig in their study. And he knows what it feels like. He knows what it feels like not to be able to learn. And so I think that's why it distresses him that Charlie, I, I think it distresses him that Algernon can't eat unless he learns because Charlie knows what it feels like to want to learn so bad and not be able to. Yeah, mouse abuse even. <laughs> so in what ways is that the same as like when kids are in school and they can't learn? How do you think that they kind of starve? Where do you, how, how is that similar? Like if you can't learn in school, in what ways is that like starvation? I would like to see this. Okay, is it fair mice pass a test to eat? Fair or unfair? So can't wait to hear what you have to say about that. Um, so she said for a person who God gave so little to, you done more than a lot of people with brains they never used. So that's his teacher. And I want you to agree or disagree that it's better to have a little and make the most of it than to have a lot and do nothing with it. That's what she's saying. Do you agree or disagree? So um, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at your comments about how it is similar to starve. I like that. I like, I like seeing those. Okay. All right. So in the story, he goes crazy with the punctuation. He learns the punctuation and he starts using all the punctuation. It's like punctuation for days. And I wanted to show you that punctuation absolutely matters. I remembered this story and I went and pulled it. It happened a couple years ago that in Maine, a dairy company had to pay $5 million because of leaving out an Oxford comma. So an Oxford comma is the comma in right before the word and in a list of things. So for lunch, I had salmon, lettuce, and a grapefruit which is actually true. Um, I had salmon, lettuce, and a grapefruit. And if I don't put a comma after the lettuce, that, that comma that I would put there or not, that's an Oxford comma. Okay, Cloudfall, you're my friend. And he says, punctuation is fun. And so I wanna share my favorite punctuation. And I think some of you might not know it. So my favorite punctuation mark of all time, bar none, I, I need to get a t-shirt that has it on it, is the interrobang. So an interrobang can also be spelled interrobang, and you really pronounce it interrobang. An interrobang looks like this. It is a mixture of an, an exclamation mark and a question mark, and it is a real thing. It is even like if you look at a paper dictionary, it's in the front of the paper dictionary as a punctuation mark. So it hasn't caught on as much as it should, and a lot of fonts don't have it. But an interrobang is used when you are asking a question, but it's an exclamatory question, right? And sometimes you'll see people do like a question mark and then an exclamation mark, but you can combine them. Okay, so you would say like, are you kidding me? Or what in the world? Or, and that's good, how, right? All of those are sentences that could end in an exclamation mark, well, or a question mark. And so we use an interrobang. And so 
I know I want that on my keyboard too. Um, okay, so your turn. I want you to put in the chat a sentence that should end with an interrobang, but if you don't have an interrobang, you have to use either a question mark or an exclamation mark or a question mark and an exclamation mark. Ooh, Will got it. How did you do that, Will? Tell us how you typed it. There we go. Um, I want to see your sentences. I want to see, like, if you had an interrobang, what sentence would you end an in what sentence would you end with an interrobang? Give me an example. I can't wait to see those next week. I cannot wait to see them. All right. Um, okay, he says, I felt naked. I wanted to hide. I ran outside and threw up. Then I walked home. It's a funny thing that I never knew that Joe and Frank and all the others like to have me around all the time to make fun of me. Now I know what it means when they say to pull a Charlie Gordon. I'm ashamed. Oh yeah, you're probably right. Michael, it's probably Unicode. Um, I, I think this is so sad, that idea, but I think he describes it so beautifully, right? I felt naked. I wanted to hide. I threw up, right? Like sometimes we get so anxious, we feel it in our stomach, right? Um, and that's normal because we have a nerve, the vagal nerve that, that makes that happen and, and some other things as well. And I just think this is so sad. And I feel like this is where we really ask the question, is it better not to know? Because if he had never gotten smart, he would never know. And he would just go along. It's so crazy. Is it better to know or not know? I'm curious about what you think. All right. Um, I think it's so ironic that the very thing you wanted is causing so much pain. This isn't a quote from the story. This is me. He says that when his IQ is tripled, quote, then maybe I'll be like everyone else and people will like me. And I'm asking, like, is that even a good goal? Like, is, is it even a good goal to want everyone to like you? Like, is that really something that's worth having? Curious. I think that this story reminds me of The Great Gatsby. Because in The Great Gatsby, if you haven't read the novel The Great Gatsby, then you you won't know this, but if you have read it, then maybe this this comparison will make sense. In The Great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby, who's played by Leonardo DiCaprio in this version of the movie, he wants this girl so badly. This is Daisy Buchanan. He wants her so badly. He knew her before he went off to war, and now she married somebody else, and he does everything in his life to get her. But she's not worth having. Like, Daisy Buchanan is to me, one of the great villains in literature. And so I think that, that this is kind of the same thing where your dream isn't worthy of you. His, Charlie was a way better person than wanting to just be smart and have people like him. He was fine the way he was. He was a good person. And he had this dream to have everybody like him, but he was better than them. He was nicer than them. In this story, it shares three views of IQ. And I think these sum up pretty well how people feel about IQ. Now, I do this a lot for my job. I work with IQ a lot. So let's look at what these three ideas are. Dr. Niemer says IQ is how smart you are. It weighs you. It weighs how smart you are, just like a scale. And... Um, the Dr. Strauss says it's how smart you can get. And that is the more common consensus. It's your, your aptitude, right? How, if you do study, will you learn? And then Bert tells him it's not really that useful. And so everybody's entitled to their own opinion about that. He says, I, could I have been that feeble-minded? He doesn't even remember not knowing. It's kind of interesting. He figured out a new way. So as he's getting smarter and smarter, he's finding it harder and harder to even remember that he didn't know, right? He says, I figured out a new way to line up the machines in the factory. Mr. Donegan said it will save him $10,000 a year in labor and increased production. And he gave me a $25 bonus. And I'm like, giving someone $25 when they save you $10,000? Fair or unfair? All right, he says, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to cut myself off there. P. 
People don't talk to me much anymore or kid around the way they used to. It makes the job kind of lonely. This intelligence has driven a wedge between me and all the people I once knew and loved. Before, they laughed at me and despised me for my ignorance and dullness, and now they hate me for my knowledge and understanding. What do they want from me? And I feel like this is just such a great line because he's acknowledging that he thought they would like him when he was like them, but he passed them, and now they don't like him. And it's like, you just can't win. You just can't win. He thought, oh, that's an interesting insight, Strudel Kitty, that they wanted him fired because it saved them in labor, meaning they could get la laid off. Ooh, interesting, interesting. Um, so Donner in German means thunder. So that's kind of interesting. All right, he, Mr. Donner, the guy in the store. All right, he thought being smart would give him more friends, but the opposite is true, or is it? Because were they his friends to begin with? I would argue they even weren't really his friends to begin with. And can you lose what you never had? Or does it count because as losing them because he thought they were his friends and now he lost the thought of it? I'm really kind of curious about this. What you think about that. Is it like the opposite is true? Is it? Did he lose his friends or not? All right. People at work. 800 people sign a petition to fire him. All except one. Fanny Gurdon. Fanny Gurdon. She is the only one. And he says this. She was one of the few people I'd known who set their mind. Oops. Sorry. Typo. Mrs. Van Typo. English teacher fail. Somebody needs to put it in the chat. English teacher fail. Um, who set their mind to something and believed it no matter what the rest of the world proved, said, or did. Oh, I love what Strudel Kitty says. He did lose them because he was able to feel the lost. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's. Hold on. I have my story right here. I saw somebody type in Donner, and that made me think of Thunder, but I don't remember his name. I don't really care for him. I have to go to the end. Donegan. It's Donegan, which is not good because that's an Irish name, and I'm a lot Irish too, and I don't like it if they do that. Thank you for the English teacher, Val. I just love this idea. So here's my hashtag. Be like Gurdon. Be like Gurdon and change your own mind, right? Don't let other... I think this is one of the strongest messages here buried in this tiny little incident in the story which is don't let anybody make you feel like you need to just go along with the crowd. 800 people. She went against 800 people. How many of us have the fortitude to do that? Like how many of us have the ability to stand up against 800 people that we work with every day? And to only change our mind because we feel that it's right not to change our mind because of that. I just, I just feel like this is so important, such an important thing. I knew what she was thinking about as she watched me toying with the chain of my rabbit's foot and my keys. So this is, this is with his teacher, Miss Kinnian. And now this is a change because before he couldn't interpret the Rorschach blots before he couldn't do that. Um, the other test where you have to try to determine what happened before. And this shows that he's not just changed what he knows, but actually, um, but he's actually processing differently. He's interpreting, he's able to read people's feelings. And he says, um, I was shocked to learn that the only ancient languages, and this is the, the doctor, right? He could read were Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Well, think only languages, the only ancient languages are three of them. <laughs> I must be careful to speak and write clearly and simply so people won't laugh, right? So it's weird because intelligence, um, intelligence has become a divider, right? And so I'm going to try to make myself a little smaller there. So if you're different, you have to adjust, right? If you're either um, smarter or not, right? You're going to be different and it's going to be a divider for you even if you are like it doesn't matter whether you're smarter than average or you're slower than average intelligence will divide you and I think that this is true I work a lot with gifted kids and I know that this is a huge struggle right intelligence is a divider okay here's the climax to me is that when the guy 
drops all the dishes and everybody in the restaurant starts making fun of him. It's so sad. And he says, I felt sick inside as I looked at his dull, vacuous smile, the wide, bright eyes of a child, uncertain, but eager to please. Not too long ago, I, like this boy, had foolishly played the clown. And I feel like this is why it's so sad. It's like he recognizes himself in that guy and it makes him realize who he was. And this, this is what I feel like is the climax. Suddenly I was furious with myself and all those who were smirking at him. I jumped up and shouted, shut up, leave him alone. It's not his fault he can't understand. For God's sake, he's still a human being. <laughs> Thunder two. And he says this, and this to me is the whole theme of the story. This is the theme of the story. Even a feeble-minded man wants to be like other men. Mic drop, right? Mic drop. Um, because we have, ooh, I think I may have messed up my um, thing. Nope, I didn't. Okay. Um, I think like this is the most important thing in the story to learn is that even a feeble-minded man wants to be like other men. And it's not just the feeble-minded. We all want to be like each other. We all want to be accepted. We all crave acceptance. We all crave acceptance. I know, Cloudfall, you're picking up, right? Like before he couldn't write so people would understand and now he can't speak because they understand but for completely opposite reasons but it's the same problem, right? It happened today, Algernon bit me and this is the beginning of the end, right? Algernon, we recognize, because do you remember when they said in the beginning, like people with low IQ will be like hostile? And so now that's how they're showing that same prejudice here by showing Algernon is hostile as he loses it. His research is like, oh, I know. So yeah, it shows, oh, Christine, exactly. It shows that intelligence isn't everything because even Charlie, who's arguably the smartest person in that room, still laughs at him. Yes, Ugh, I know. Okay. So he does all this research. He wants to find out like what's going to happen. And he, he, and he knows he's not even going to be able to read the research later. He's not going to be able to read it, but he does it. And I feel like it's like planting a tree under whose shade you will never sit because you're doing this thing and you know that you won't actually benefit from it. And I love people who do that. I love people who do something nice knowing that it will never benefit them. I just think that's so nice. And then he says, I feel the darkness closing in. And, and this is the, the, like, as he starts to have his intelligence decline, this is the, the falling action in it. And it's very rare for the character's own intelligence to match and align with the falling action to fly in with the plot. But it's like so, oh, it's so painful to watch, right? And it, his description of his losing of his mind as the darkness closing in is so powerful. And he says, he mentions these like fugue states that he goes in. And so I thought I would share with you our whale of the word for today, which is fugue. So a fugue has two meanings. The first meaning is it is a particular kind of musical um, composition. And the second kind of fugue is a, like a psychotic break almost. It's a fugue state where you don't really remember where you were. And that's what he's talking about here. And he says, I put flowers on Algernon's grave about once a week. Mrs. Flynn thinks I'm crazy to put flowers on a mouse's grave, but I told her that Algernon was special. I told him the doctor, I had a friend called Algernon once, but he was a mouse. Can a pet be a friend? I don't have this as a, as a question, but I'm curious. Can a pet be a true friend? So curious, that would be interesting. And he goes back to work. Later, Frank Riley came over and said, Charlie, if anybody bothers you or tries to take advantage, you call me or Joe and we will set him straight. And this is interesting. Um, this is interesting because do you remember when we did the character thing earlier? And in my chart, it says that flat characters can't be dynamic. They don't change. But this is an exception. This is, that's a general rule. Here's an exception. Because these guys are flat characters. These guys who are at his work, who he thought were his friends, they're flat characters. We don't really know anything about them except for how they behave towards him. And we only see it from Charlie's point of view. We don't know what they're like with their families. We don't know anything about them really. But they change. Frank Riley has changed. Frank Riley has changed. He's ready to help them. And he says, please, 
please let me not forget how to read and write. And this is just so painful. Like, you just can feel it. You can just feel it, right? I want to know, of all the injustice in this story, so much injustice, them trying this surgery out on him in the first place, them being mean to him, giving him $25 when they saved 10, when he saved them 10,000, um, you know, losing his, losing his intelligence again, like everything that happened. What do you think is the greatest injustice of all? I want to know. And he goes to Mrs. Kinnian's class and here's the line that always makes me cry. Every time I read this story, this line makes me cry. Except I'm not going to this time because I just read it um, a minute ago. Okay, then all of a sudden I remembered some things about the operation and me getting smart, right? So even though he's lost his intelligence, he has this memory. And I said, holy smoke, I really pulled a Charlie Gordon that time. And it's like, oh, he's, he's gone back. He's gone back to not even realize, like, but he realizes and he doesn't realize. It's just so bad, right? Like, it's just so bad. I know. Oh, interesting, Michael. His inability to keep what he has won. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, I love Christy. <laughs> my cat is my friend because he tries to comfort me when I'm sad. And we can get into arguments about who gets the most space in the chair. That's cute. All right, I want to talk about the hero of the story. The hero is often the protagonist, but in this story, the hero, all the props, all the props to Ms. Kinian. And I know that we're going to be a couple minutes late tonight. Um, okay, I think this is why she's so amazing. That she's so amazing. She believes in him. That's hysterical will. The greatest injustice is showing up late. Sometimes you guys don't have control of your schedules, though. Um, oops, oops, oops. Why is she the hero? She believes in him, which I think is so ironic because her belief in him is what got him into this trouble in the first place. And I wonder, do you think she regrets it? Like, do you think she regrets what happened? Like, she's the one who, like, put him into the study. Like, it was because of her recommendation. But she's willing to see him as changed, right? And I think a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people, like, even if you do change, you, you don't, right? Like, you don't, even if you've really changed, people still tend to see you that way, right? She pays his rent at the end when he can't even get out of bed. Like, I think she is so amazing. I, I, she, to me, she's the hero in this story. I just feel like she's the hero. Um, that's why I'm going away from New York for good, where nobody knows that Charlie Gordon was a genius, and now he can't even read a book or write good. Okay. Oh, man. It's like so sad and he, that he's leaving. And here's, here's Charlie Wisdom, another hashtag to add. It's a good feeling to know things and be smart. And he also says, it's easy to make friends if you, uh-oh, miss, uh-oh, English teacher fail, English teacher fail. It should say, if you let people laugh at you. And I feel like there are so many bam moments in this story. There are so many like straight fire that he preaches in this story. And I just love that. Yes, be like Miss Kinian. I love that, Cloudfall. Absolutely, be like Miss Kinian. There are two of examples of that in this story. Two examples of that. And then the very end, please, if you get a chance, put some flowers on Algernon's grave. Oh, this, this is it right here. Make sure this story changes you. It doesn't even actually matter if you like it. This isn't necessarily a story to like. This is a story to let change you so that you will never be like the people who he worked with. You will never be that person. You will never be the person who goes along with a crowd teasing and making fun of someone else. That you will be willing to stand up for what's right, even if you stand alone, right? Even if you stand alone like Fanny, make sure that you recognize that nobody in your life should have to let you laugh at them to be your friend. And that you have a lot of power 
make sure it changes you so that you know that even if there's something that drives you crazy about yourself that you feel like you'd be willing to to hurt yourself for that you recognize that it won't work and don't do it so oh i'm not saying that you can't like this story i'm just saying if you don't like this story it doesn't matter right it can still change you it can still change you so i hope i hope that this story will have the same impact on you that it will have on that, that it had on me so many decades ago that i read it and that when you think back on the experience of reading it you will recognize it as a moment where you had a turning point in in who you were and even if you are a really nice person now i think that this story can help you be even just a little bit better all right so next class february 26th the story the most dangerous game a very 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 different story than tonight all right so i want to thank you guys so much as always i've been so looking forward to this and i don't know those of you who joined in in the very beginning did you notice that i figured out how to put like a class is starting soon and i did that because it's hard to join the class in the beginning if the stream isn't going yet so yay um so i'm so excited all right so you guys i just want to say Thank you so much. And I see your comments in here. Simon, I see that while you may not like the story, you've learned a lot from it. Show me some important lessons. And Jason, I know, I love the story, right? So it's like, um, oh, how funny. My friend asked me, is this a class with a cool teacher who named her Robot Feely? <laughs> you guys, you know, we had to send him away again. He just came back again. Um, okay, well, I didn't change your mind. Ah, all right. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. And I hope you all have a great weekend. And I can't wait to see you next February. Remember in February, not next February. Um, and then, oh, that's hysterical, Will. That is funny. <laughs> How dangerous could a game even be? Oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, yes. If you haven't emailed me, um, we haven't read um, Most Dangerous Game yet. Um, if you haven't emailed me yet and and your address and you want a um a bookmark let me know i'm also going to upload the file and i'll let you guys know about that i'm going to upload the file so if you want to print more of them you can um so you could just print them out yourself um i will still mail them though because i'll mail like the signed laminated ones